Did you ever see the, uh, I, you must have, some of these videos of Horowitz playing? Yeah, of course. I mean, years ago, I haven't seen them in years, but I remember watching one. This is like, you know, 40, 50 years ago. Maybe it was when he returned to Carnegie Hall. This was a famous concert. Yeah. Um, and I just remember the sound was like a lot of notes, you know, Chopin. And his fingers were just like this. Yes. I couldn't believe it. I was like, how is he doing that? Where is it coming from? Yeah. <laughs> It's pretty amazing. Yeah. So, Did you get to see him live? No, I never did. I never saw Horowitz live. Never saw Coltrane live. Hmm. Um, when I came to New York as a 18-year-old college student, It was 1966. 66, yeah. So you could have yeah. seen Coltrane. But I didn't. But I'll yeah. tell you what I did see. I saw Phil Woods, saw Monk with Charlie Rouse, Ben Riley, you know, wow. the group. <clears throat> That was a double bill at five in the afternoon. I saw Miles' quintet, you know, the Herbie, Ron, Tony, that one, Wayne. And... I remember it was at the Vanguard. The cover was like $4 and $5 on the weekends. And what I remember very clearly is I went down three nights that week. And the only tune I could follow was Footprints because I knew it was a minor blues. The rest of the stuff, you know, at that time in my life, I was still an alto saxophonist. And I was listening to like, you know, Bird and Phil Woods and Sonny Rollins and all that, you know. Mm -hmm. And what Miles was doing was totally beyond me. But I, I also remember I went down the three nights. And the first night, Miles played, you know, long solo. Wayne played long solo. Herbie would play two, three choruses. He'd get about a couple minutes into his solo, and Miles would come in, cut him off, and take the tune out. And I thought that was a little weird. So I came back a couple nights later. And it's the same thing, except now Miles is cutting them off like after a chorus or a chorus and a half. And that was really weird, you know, because Miles and Wayne were playing like for 10 minutes, you know, five. Minutes. So then I come back the third night. Miles plays long. Wayne plays long. And. Herbie starts a solo, and here's how he solos. -da 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 -da. And he looks out of the corner of the eye at Miles like, okay, MF, you're going to cut me out now? <laughs> and then he went back and he played another phrase. Then he looked like this. The vibes on the bandstand were completely weird. And meanwhile, you know, the band sounded great. But mm -hmm. so that was my, uh, that was my, my initiation I, in, I was into hoping the you real life of Jet of jazz and what sometimes happens on the bandstand. Yeah. You know. I was hoping you'd tell that story because you told me that story before. When before, we, when yeah. We, when we hung out yeah. and this story helped me so much, you know, in my playing. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm struggling. I'm struggling to find the pauses, you know. And this story has really helped me, you know. I feel like Herbie had a one of his, you know, many lessons with Miles during what you've witnessed there in this week. Well, You know, it was John Schofield who told me, you know, we would talk about what his time with Miles was like. I worked with Schofield in 86 for about a year, year or two. And uh, he said, Miles likes to F blank, blank, blank with people, you know. And he does that with people he loves. That's the way John described it. Uh, I remember Bob Berg, who, who worked with my band for a couple years in the, in the 90s. He says, man, he says, one night, you know, I'm playing and Miles, right in the middle of the set, he says to me, Bob, why you play so high on the horn all the time, you know? So Bob says, you know, so I thought about it and I, oh, well, all right. So the next night, you know, I think it was Newport, whatever it was, Bob started playing lower on the horn, right? Miles comes over to him and says, Bob, why do you play so low on the horn all the time? <laughs> <laughs> so at that point, Bob says, okay, so I got it. He was yeah. just messing, you know. Yeah. Um, 
but in line with 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 the Herbie thing, I mean, this was this was the first thing that really, I mean, it hit me like uh, kind of like a shock in a good way, you know, because if you listen to like the Carnegie Hall concert, you know, there's the the Stella by Starlight uh, and Funny Valentine. Yeah. And that and four and more are the same concert, as far as I'm aware. Yeah. Two different albums. Yeah. The one has all the uptunes and the other has mostly the ballads and mediums. And there are places in Stella or Funny Valentine where Herbie's like, just for like 10 seconds, you know, he'll pull out of his back pocket these unbelievable chops playing this beautiful impressionistic stuff, right? And then... The rest of the time, he'll play real sparse and, you know, good time, swinging, a lot of taste and really choosing and picking his spots, whether he's comping or is soloing. Mm. And I got fascinated because, you know, McCoy Tyner, who was great, who might already really checked out, it was in your face 24-7, you know, a lot and great stuff, you know. And Keith... Not as hard on it as McCoy, but still very in your face with his chops and everything. Um, Herbie's almost never in your face. And I got fascinated. I thought, here's this guy. He's got as much stuff as these other two cats. Mm. And he's just saving it. Mm -hmm. So I started listening to him a lot, you know, mostly stuff from the 60s. I, I kind of stayed with it through the Thrust album. And after that, I kind of lost interest. Mm. Um, whether that's my fault or whether he changed, I don't know. But mm. um, the first thing I started listening for when I really got that was not anymore what he was playing. What he was playing was fabulous, right? And you know that, you know, mm. and hip voicings and scales, all that, all that kind of stuff. But what was he not playing mm -hmm. and why, you know? And and the most obvious one is like uh, the minor blues on the Eye of the Hurricane on Maiden Voyage. Mm -hmm. um, Freddie starts playing. And, you know, my little rap I do with master classes is I say, you know, now you got to picture this. This is the hot young rhythm section in New York. And they're playing with their peer, their buddy, Freddie, right? Instead of Miles. Now it's George Coleman, not Wayne. But otherwise, you know, this is the this is the band. But now they have the trumpet player that they're buddies with. And not that they don't like Miles, but this is really their buddy, right? Yeah. And this is Herbie's date, and this is going to be the thing. And the first thing he does behind Freddie is he strolls. He yeah. comps a little bit and then he strolls for a couple choruses. And yeah. I said, Why do you think he's doing that? So and and nobody gets it, you know. Mm. And he's waiting. He wants to feel where Freddie's going, you yeah. know. And then when he comes in, you know, when McCoy would lay out, which he didn't a lot, but when he was ready to come in, I mean, he got bang, you know, mm -hmm. the 20 finger chord on all <laughs> triple fortissimo, which is fine. I mean, that that suited what he does. But Herbie would sneak in swinging, you know, asymmetric mm -hmm. stuff, really totally independent. I think maybe the most independent left hand I've ever heard. Mm -hmm. And somebody might somebody might say Keith, and I would say, yeah, in terms of setting up a vamp and playing over it. Mm -hmm. But in terms of like rhythmic, real loose rhythmic independence of the two hands, yep. I don't know. I think that's the loosest I've ever. So I was absolutely smitten. I thought this is like, this guy's got something going on up here. Mm -hmm. um, What's your favorite so yeah, record was, of his? I've, where do you start? You know, mm -hmm. any, anything from 63 through Thrust, really. Anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a couple... There's a couple I discovered a, li a little late in the game. Bob Belton hit me to one, uh, my late friend. Uh, it's a Donald Bird date. And uh, I forget the name of the record, but there's a tune called The Procrastinator. 
wait, that's the name of the of the Lee Morgan album also. Lee, Lee Morgan, Morgan. I'm sorry, not Donald Byrd. Lee yeah. Morgan. Yeah. The Procrastinator. I love that album. That's he, incredible. Yeah, well, he plays great solo on the Procrastinator. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I remember Bob showed it to me. I mean, I don't know when, you know, it was many years ago, but this was fairly late in my, you know, I was almost out of listening to Herbie at that point, but I'd never mm -hmm. heard this. And I just went, holy, wow, this is great. How yeah. did I miss this one? So there are these little gems, you know, there's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the George Benson White Rabbit, right? No, I don't know that one. Okay, you got to check it out. When Creed Taylor had this label CTI and he was CTI, putting out yeah. all this yeah he was putting out all this third stream stuff and and I'm not a real fan of most of it but anyway you know he did something with George Benson and Billy Cobbs on drums I'm trying to remember who played bass might have been Ron I can't really remember yeah and Herbie's on it but Fender Rhodes right mm -hmm. which he was great at yeah. Well, it's like, I remember I was listening to it with, a, I think it was with a Finnish pianist named Yukas Watala. You know him? No. I have not heard him play piano, but 40 years ago, he came to New York. He was a drummer. Mm -hmm. And he put together a project with me, Jeff Andrews, Bob Mitzer, I think Randy Brecker. He's a great drummer. And 20, 25 years later, I was surprised to see he was playing piano, hmm. you know. And I, I remember he, he's out of the blue. He sent me an email or something. He said he liked an album I'd done or something. So I mailed him back. I said, I said, what did you stop playing drums for? You were a great drummer. He writes back. He said, you're one to talk. <laughs> so I, said, I said, okay, okay. <laughs> But he, he hit me to that, as I recall. And I remember uh -huh. we were sitting listening to it. George gets done playing, and George plays pretty good, you know. Mm. And then Herbie starts to play, and it's just like Yukas looks at me, and he says, there he goes. And he's mm -hmm. right, boy, he's off and flying, you know. Mm. And, and Great, the rest of the record, out. yeah, the rest of the record is like, eh, you know. Yeah. But that one solo is like, man. Do you know this uh, this record, um, Ron Carter, Uptown Conversations? I haven't heard it in a long time, but I know the record. That's another one of those. There's only like two or three songs that are really killing for me, but uh, it's that's Ron and also Billy Cobham and Herbie and, and Trio. And they play mm. uh, that song, I think they play Einbahnstraße, you know? Yeah, yeah, that song. I and that. I think might and they might even play also first trip or something like this you know so yeah. it's really yeah. it's really special and i'm i'm really also looking for these kind of of lesser known dates you know if the, if there's yeah. a record in herbie's discography that i haven't checked out yet and this you know the white rabbit i, I haven't heard it so i will white I will rabbit check is it out. like that's just the, and you know the miroslav record right oh yeah jack of and joe henderson yeah. yeah i mean those are all great but uh I would I would say the electric piano playing on White Rabbit is is at that level, but mm. you know the 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 tune he's playing on is obviously a lot more inside, right? But what he does with it is just it's phenomenal, you know. Mm. Great. And and yeah, that's 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 a, just the beginning of that solo is, uh, and you'll see, it, it's like it's it's a typical herbie moment where you know it's starting out i believe it's c major mm. you know uh it's a pretty simple tune it's like uh, it's like c major for six bars and then d minor 7 to g7 you know it's pretty simple stuff and he starts out as solo and i'm thinking god i would never think of starting my solo that way and it's so mm -hmm. cool you know yeah. i mean he just he that period his taste was just impeccable mm. you know so that that did it for me i mean that was sort of the area aesthetically i was interested in and eventually you know the the details of his approach i left behind because i wanted to find my own way of doing it but but the overall 
lessons, mm -hmm. which I'm still reminding myself of all the time. You know, mm -hmm. don't play too much. Listen, blah blah blah. I mean, it's all it's always there, and and uh, you know, it's it's pretty amazing. And he did all this right before he was like 35, I guess. Mm -hmm. Did you ever get to see him live in the 60s, uh, you know, with different bands than Miles? Um, I don't think so. I mean, there was the the next time, mm, close, early 70s, I was living in Berkeley, California, and he came to a, what was really like a rock club where normally, you know, it was one of these rooms, no tables. Everybody just stood up and listened on, on the stage, you know, a huge place. I forget the name of it. And um, he came with a sextet with, you know, Billy Hart, uh, Buster. Oh, what, and what uh, did she? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Eddie mm -hmm. Henderson, Eddie Mop, and that band. Um, and it was all Fender Rhodes. And, and that was good, you know, but at that point he was kind of, taking a back seat to the rest of the band, you know, letting mm. them do most of the playing, mm. which was great. Um, I also heard him with that band at a club called The Both Slash And in San Francisco and also at the Vanguard. Mm -hmm. And what I remember about those two gigs is by the time he was at the both end, Buster was playing all Fender to bass and looked bored out of his mind because mm -hmm. you know he was having to read that mm -hmm. over and over again, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, did not look thrilled. Billy Hart was on fire, you know, yeah. kind of that jazz yeah. rock thing, sort of. <laughs> Sort of, sort of the way Jack used to play, mm -hmm. um, you know, but his own take on it. And Billy was mm -hmm. just lighting up the bandstand. Yeah. And um, yeah. and then I remember the only time I saw Herbie get a little defensive at all is somebody in 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 the audience yelled something about sounds like Miles. And Herbie got up between tunes and he says, "Listen," he says, well, "You know, we're doing our own thing up here." He says. But you got to remember who helped really contribute to that sound of Miles in the first place, meaning himself, you know. Ooh, okay. Yeah, he got he got a little bugged and he sermonized a little bit. That's the only time I saw him lose his cool. And, mm -hmm. he, you know, he didn't really lose his cool. It was just very unherby like you know? Yeah. Um, Interesting. But the, the gig was great. The other time... I went with a drummer friend of mine, and, and I'm going to guess this is 71. So that band is just getting off the ground, right? And um, uh, Buster was playing upright. Billy was playing. And they did some kind of free bag intro, whatever tune it was. And then the trio starts, and Herbie's kind of just – comping very sparsely and buster and billy are setting up the screw like here you know and billy was looking at buster like this and this big smile was spreading across his face and the drummer and i looked at each other like this like wow i mean what they were playing was very simple but the groove was so wide Yeah. And we were in the back of the vanguard on the banquette on the side. You could feel it all the way back there. And we were like, this is amazing, you know. Mm. And and the whole set was great, you know. And I, I did get to play with Buster once on what was otherwise a kind of a strange gig uh, years later. And it was just like that. His beat was so fat. Mm. It was very easy to play. Mm -hmm. um, this was about... 20, 25 years ago with Larry Coriel. Mm -hmm. And the gig was actually fun. It was all standards. Larry was playing amplified acoustic. And and I had fun. It was very easy to play with Buster. The only thing was it was really loud. Mm -hmm. um, 
and I think that's still the case. A lot of people have lost their hearing, you know. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. So a lot their, of that generation. their reality, yeah, their reality is it's the same volume they've always played at. But my reality is, oh, that's really loud. But in the case with Buster and Larry, I just put in earplugs and it was cool. Yeah. So. How does he react? I mean, Buster, how does he react harmonically to you? Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> maybe I told you this story too, but that's No, the, I don't think so. Okay, well, you, you nailed the question. Larry calls me up the next day. You know, Larry and I knew each other for years. He never hired me for a gig, but he'd come down to my loft and we'd play. Uh, because he hired this drummer who the drummer and I like to play together a lot. So he would call up Larry, Larry would come over and he calls me up the next day, smart. So yeah, this is Larry. Oh, all right. How'd you like the gig, man? He said it was fun, which it was, it was all standards. You know, it was the acoustic amplified, so it wasn't too loud. And Larry just played and got out of the way. It was actually fine. I remember Beaver Harris was on drums and he oh. was he was pretty bad, you know, mm -hmm. not a great time player. But the thing is, Buster's time was so strong, he made Beaver sound okay. You know, even when Beaver was going to mess it up, he couldn't mess it up too long because the beat was so strong, he could jump right back on it, you know. Um, and, and what I remember in particular was the night's going real well. And all of a sudden, Larry turns around and says, just friends, gee, one, two, one, two, three, four. Da, 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 da. <laughs> and I'm like, first of all, I never played the tune hardly. And when I did play it, it was on alto, the bird version with strings. And of course, I'm used to it in A flat, you know. Mm -hmm. So Larry's going along playing and, it, you know, it, it's fine. But I remember all I can think of is like, it's like I'm lying. Um, it's like I'm lying in the hospital, and I know I'm going to die in two minutes because the gig's been nice, but there is no way I can play this tune in this key this fast. Beaver, blah blah blah. It's been fun. Larry finishes, big flourish, and walks off, and I start playing, and it felt like here because Buster's wow. beat was so fat, it was easy. Um, and you know, most of the gig. I played sort of my middle 60s Herbie stuff because, you know, I figured that's what Buster knows from all those records, The Prisoner and all that. I figured and it, it worked out great. You know, he just did what he did. It slid in right with that. It was totally appropriate. So Larry calls me the next day, as I said, and he says, you like the gig? I said, yeah. He says, how'd you like Buster? I said, it was great. Great beat. I had a good time. He says, you want to know what he said? <laughs> I said, what? He says, Larry, what the heck was that piano player playing? <laughs> <laughs> and I thought I was bringing it inside. Yeah. So that, I, I wasn't sure what lesson to take from that. One was, you know, maybe I hadn't brought it back in as far as I thought I was, but Believe me, I didn't play anything further out than what's on The Prisoner. No way, mm. you know. Yeah. So the second lesson I learned was if he's playing with Herbie and Herbie does it, that's legal. Yeah. But if somebody else does it, that's a different story, you know. Mm -hmm. And and this is, it's like when I went to hear Miles at the Vanguard. This is just real life. Musicians are human beings. Mm. And sometimes you don't get rational responses and, and it's a shame but it's the way it is he's a great bass player never saw him again you know mm. but he's made some wonderful records and that's fine i got to play with him once i was happy you know? mm. i see um that's actually a, an interesting topic that i would like to talk to you about you know uh, reharmonizing stuff and finding new colors uh, on the instrument and i i think you're really Uh, a pioneer for that, um, you know, finding finding new colors to, you know, more generally known harmonies, uh, and that way you really found a, an own harmonic language. I, th I feel, and mm. I one, I'm wondering how you how you go about it. Well, the first thing I do, as long as I've been listening to music, starting with the Beatles, "I Want to Hold Your Hand." 
is if I hear something that's, huh? Right? Because up to then, rock and roll was 1625, you know? And I want to hold your hand. It's what? 1, 5, 6 minor, 3 minor. Mm -hmm. It's totally backwards, you know? Mm. And I remember when I heard that, I sat at the piano and I figured it out. I kept playing it. And I thought, this is really cool, you know? And that's the way I've operated from now, well, from then, all the way not only to now, but in between. For example, when one day our mutual friend, Jason Seitzer, sent me this track from a live concert of you playing the Joni Mitchell tune, Marcy. Oh. And, and Jason said, check this out. And uh, I remember I listened to it and my jaw dropped because like you were in there. You did it. It was great. You did it your own way. And my first reaction, and I know enough other musicians and another, enough other piano players, people are going to have all kinds of different reactions. And you may remember my first reaction was to let Jason know and thank him. And my second reaction was to write you an email yeah. and tell you how good I thought it was. Because like, if I hear something new and different, just like I did with I Want to Hold Your Hand, I get excited. I'm like, mm -hmm. this is cool, you mm -hmm. know? And I have seen other musicians, including friends, including people I respect, you know, get jealous or get bugged and all this. You know, I mean, I'm human. I feel that sometimes. But in my case, that's completely overridden by the excitement I get, the charge I get out of it. You know? yeah. And the flip, the flip side of that is I can go hear somebody I really respect. I mean, you can, I don't have to name anybody. You can pick a name mm. and I go down there and it just, it's not happening, mm. you know? And after two tunes, I really want to leave the club. And most of the time I do mm. just because not because of out of disrespect, but just because why do I want to be here? This is a drag, you know? Um, and that's just, that's just the way I am. I mean, the, the, it, and I'd like to sit here and, and, and say, you know, I don't care who's making the music and isn't that nice and all people are the same. Yeah, that's part of it. But for me, it's just always been, this is so cool. Mm. I mean, why, why would one not want to get into this and check it out and acknowledge how cool it is? A, it's fun. B, I learned something. Yeah. And then C, I mean, if, if somebody else is going to have a different kind of reaction in that situation, that's fine. I don't have time for that. Mm -hmm. I'm in this for one thing my whole life, and that's for music, you know. Mm. And and that goes back to like when when I was first buying records, and you know, I grew up like a mile from Mike Brecker, and we were high school friends. And you know, if one of us got a new record. You know, one would call the other. You should check this out. You should check yeah. this out. That's what it's supposed to be about, you know. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I see a lot of the other stuff that goes on. And it, it in a way, it saddens me a little bit. But the way I deal with it is I don't deal with it. Yeah. I just, I know it's there. That's That's not what I'm interested in, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and, uh, so here we are. So the question is the chords. So whether it's your version of Marcy or whether it's Herbie or whoever, or I want to hold your hand or whatever it is, if there's something unusual, I got to figure it out. Yeah. It's, it, it's almost an obsession. You know, what is that? And, you know, sometimes it can be something so complicated that I never do quite get it. And that's okay. 
but in the process of figuring it out, you'll find something you'll different. A bunch. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And I remember one of the most <laughs> humbling moments of my life is in the, I want to say, yeah, in the 80s. I had moved back to New York, but I was still commuting every week to Washington and D.C. I had a, two nights of trio, Sunday and Monday, and all day Monday I teach in a friend's apartment, you know, teach seven, eight, nine students. And then Tuesday morning, I'd fly back, $29 flight, which they had at that time, back to New York, and that's how I was making my New York rent, you know, because I had two gigs and students in a weekend, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I had one student, I'm, I'm quite sure he's, he's not alive anymore. Uh, he was a psychologist in Washington. Very nice guy, single. Um, and, you know, he was, he was a competent player. He didn't play full time, you know, so there were some holes. But the thing that was interesting is he had his totally own thing with harmony, you know. And, you know, he studied with me for two, three years, and it was always fun because he got everything I showed him. And he was able to incorporate it. And, he, you know, he kept playing better. Um, and so one time I said, check this out. And I played a mescalero, right? And uh, I said, so take this home and bring back a couple of the, the voicings you think you can find. A couple, right? That mm -hmm. heard me play. Now, you know, like I'm sure a lot of us, I've listened to that quite a bit over the years. It's like an incredible track, the whole yeah. track, right? And uh, he comes back and he's got the whole thing. Whoa, oh, no, okay. no measures, no measures. But here's this voicing he's playing here. Here's this voicing he's playing here, here, here. I don't have the sheet of paper anymore. He said, you keep it. God knows what I did with it. I should be shot. But <laughs> um, I mean, I checked it out and he nailed it. I said, Don, how did you do this? He said, he giggled. He said, well, I just kept listening to it. Like, so did I. It's that simple, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't get them all, you know. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's that tickled me to death, you know. Mm. And uh, I, I remember, I, I, you know, I played through them, and then a few days later I played through them, and then I thought, I should probably memorize all these. And then I thought, nah, mm -hmm. you know. I got the idea. I don't want to sound exactly like Herbie. Yeah. But this guy got it. I mean, it was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. um, so, but when you do find a chord that you, you know, throughout the research or the, the process you discovered, um, what do you do with it? Okay. That's a good question. And the answer is nothing. <laughs> Now, let me explain. The, the things that have influenced me most are either music, which we've been talking about, or theoretical books, whether they're jazz or classical music or whatever, that have approached it from a certain way. And one of the books I like a great deal uh, You may know of it. I don't know if we've ever talked about it, but it's called The Shaping Forces in Music by Ernst Tuch. It's an Austrian Drew. composer. Drew told yeah. me about him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, I when Drew was 18, I said, man, you got to get this book. I told him to, I played with him. We were both in Washington, Baltimore area. And here was this kid. I mean, he was playing the SHIT out of the bass, but he brought a real book and he's reading tunes out of the real book. This is on like a, a private party duo gig, you know. Mm. I said, listen, I'd like to hire you for my bands because he was head and shoulders above anybody I was playing with down there. But I said, you got to do a couple things for me. He said, what? I said, first of all, get this, the Ernst Tuck book. And the second thing I said was burn the real book. Yeah. What do I do? Memorize it. 
where you want to play, you know, and he did it. <laughs> so mm -hmm. anyway, um, <clears throat> but the but the point of the Ernst Talk book is it's not about this chord or this chord or this chord. It's about the movement. Right. Yeah. And the independence of the voices and all that. And I remember I used to read that chapter on harmony two, three times a week when I was 17 years old before I went to sleep. I was just like, this is so cool. Yeah. Now, keep in mind, I'm still a saxophone player. Right. Mm -hmm. So when I went to piano, I had a very interesting skill set. Right. I couldn't play a three octave major scale fast to save my life in two hands. Mm -hmm. You know, especially in the left hand. Arpeggios, forget about it. You know, on the other hand, I knew what to play. I knew what I was hearing. So it was just a question of getting that. Okay. And there were several approaches I could have used. <clears throat> and what I did, and I remember this very clearly, I did two things. I was writing a lot of tunes with the kind of harmonies I heard. So my hands were literally learning to find different things not the normal kind of piano stuff the second thing is is i would sit and play a ballad for a half hour an hour when i fall in love all in the middle right bill evans head down yep not worrying about the bass not worrying about this and just playing with the inner voices real slow you know and i then i do it in a different key yeah. And later on, of course, I found out that when Bill was learning a tune, he would take tunes through different keys. He did that in front of uh, Warren Bernhardt. And mm -hmm. Warren told me about it. I didn't know that. But I stumbled on the same uh, modus operandi. You know? Yeah. And uh, that was that was very helpful. And if I found something along the way I liked... And I really didn't want to forget it. I'd write it down. Okay. So I had notebooks of various ideas. Okay. But I never used the ideas as something I had to memorize. I used the ideas as like, and I still do this, as something to just restart my brain. So when I'm starting to work on my stuff, I have a jumping off point. Yeah. What happens after that is what's important. Mm. So it's the process. And and uh, what I've trained myself to do over the years is to hear and see all the stuff moving and just deal with it, you know, and not look for now I'm going to drop this. Now I'm yeah. going to drop that. And it it's listen, there's a plus and a minus to it. The, the plus is, is I've been if I've been practicing. And the process is really oiled up uh it's it's effortless you know and i'm finding new stuff as i'm playing and it feels great uh and to me that's what jazz is supposed to be about you know it's kind of different as you're going along and it feels good and it's fun if i hadn't been practicing then i have to fall back on what i've memorized except i haven't memorized that much you know so then it starts then i i get bugged with it because I'm not going anywhere, you know. Mm -hmm. So the more I can I can work on it, the better. And um, the other thing it does is it 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 plays into everything else we were talking about. Because if I'm listening to and reacting to what's happening on the piano and changing my plans based on what I'm hearing and seeing, I'm already tuned into doing that with the other cats. And with yeah. the music as a whole, yeah. So, yeah. so I don't have an agenda when I'm when I'm tuned in. A lot of you know, I'm, I'm human. Sometimes I have a bad night, but when I'm tuned in, it's like I'm doing that with everybody. It know? seems to me that way also because when I listen to you or when I see you live, it seems like when you start out, you don't have a plan or you don't have a even a goal or something to to go you're very much in the moment and that that way and uh i hope this comes across the the, the right way an in intro can take a long time or an <laughs> outro you know or an outro an outro vamp can take a long time you know what well, i mean 
yeah it, yeah it and can actually, take a long time i've been working on condensing that a little bit <laughs> <laughs> but but um you know you know, Miles' famous comment when, when, he, when he asked Coltrane not to play so long and, and, and Coltrane said, well, Miles, I know what you mean, but like, I don't know. I don't know how to do it. Once I get started, you know, I got, because he had all these ideas he was working on. <laughs> Miles said, take the flipping horn out of your mouth. <laughs> yeah. So I can relate on both sides of the equation. Um, mm. But uh, in general, for me, it's it's about. I mean, th this is this is the big link I have with everybody I play with. But maybe the best example is Peacock. You know, mm. um, I mean, that's all he's about. Yeah. You know, and and the 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 odd thing is, is I'm sure the public, especially the general public, as opposed to the jazz public, has this idea of him as he's part of this trio with Keith and Jack. And listen, that's a lot of great music, but to me, that's maybe the least interesting part of his output. Mm -hmm. Gary's, you mm -hmm. know, um, it's a great trio, but I mean, you know, there's, there's so many other records where he plays just at a whole other level. You know, it's been documented. Yeah. Can you name some of your favorite out, uh, of his uh, output? I mean, there's 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 several things he's done with me. I think are, he really plays pretty spectacular on. But mm. I'd have to start thinking which are my favorites. Um, one of them I know is out of print, which is this All Blues at Night, um, which is with Bill Stewart and Tim Hagens. Um, we did a duo record together for a pirouette. I think it's called Insight, maybe. That's a good one. It's the black and red. Yeah, black and yeah. red. Yeah. 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 Um, I did one with him for Sunnyside years ago called At Night. And he plays he plays wonderfully on that. I just In listened fact, to that one. A, pardon me? I just listened to that one. To, oh, yeah. Today, before this. Yeah, I, I I remember he he did a somebody did a article on him years ago in one of the big magazines, Bass Player Magazine, and they wanted a solo of his to transcribe, and he picked his solo on that night on that record. Mm -hmm. You know, nice. Um, yeah, so he he was proud of that one. Um, but I mean the you know the spring. The record with Tony. I mean, there's so much stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that but first you were. E Sorry, go ahead. No, that's all right. That first ECM record with Paul Blay. Mm -hmm. With uh, it's ECM number three. That's how yeah, I yeah, remember yeah. it. How long is no? Uh, how long ago and far away, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And when will the blues leave? You know, I mean. It's pretty, pretty spectacular. Mm -hmm. But um, Gary is like, I mean, it is not in his mental makeup to prepare anything, you know. And sometimes that can be disadvantageous, but <laughs> most most of the time, it's a real pleasure, you know. And I mean, the first time I played with him, it was like. I mean, we were just at the sound check, you know, and I was this nervous 35 year old kid in Seattle. Uh, and and I sat down behind the piano, Jerry Grinelli's banging away at his drums, putting them together and Gary's warming up. And it's just like, you know, these flurries of insane notes, you know, mm. and I'm just sitting there thinking. What have I done? <laughs> you know, I can't possibly play with. Him. And all of a sudden, he hung a long note. You know, low down. And I just went, and I lay down some voicing. Then he hits another long note. I'm not even looking, right? Yeah. I'm behind the full board of the piano like this, trying to hide. He hits another long note, different one. So I hit another voicing. And they were both kind of cool, 
you know. Yeah. And I look up and he's grinning ear to ear and nodding wow. his head like this, you know. Nice. And it's it was like that for the for the next half century, pretty much. You know, it's mm-hmm. just uh, wow. You know, it's just just whatever's going on right there. You know, and mm-hmm. and the other thing I remember is, you know, until the last five six years ago, when Manfred decided to make a thing out of Gary's trio, up to then the gigs were all my gigs, and so. We, I never had a set list, particularly with, with trio, you know. And I can tell you I would play any standard, any key. And I think I stumped him once in all those years. Once. And that was Haunted Heart in E, which is tricky, you mm-hmm. know. And, and so that one I wrote out for him. But other than that, it didn't matter what I started, what key he was on it. Wow. Just yeah. radar ears, you know. Mm. Um, and that's, you know, that that made perfect sense to me, not only in terms of the way I was describing how I view harmony, but even the way I practice tunes in different keys. I mean, I don't count steps. That's mm. just a last resort if I can't figure out what I'm doing, yeah. you know, or half steps. Otherwise, it's just, well, that's, the note at the top, whether it's a melody or it's a top note of a chord I want to use. This is the bass. This is the color I want. You know. Yeah. In the key, you know, mm-hmm. and and that's the way you find new stuff to me. Totally. Yeah. And you rediscover yeah. the the standards you think you know. You rediscover them, and then all the I always find because I'm doing it the same way. You know, I start with any note. <laughs> And then see uh, what this note uh, is. The this is the first melody note of you know how haunted heart or something. Yeah. And then and then uh, you. Um, I, I always feel like all the moments, all the colors that don't come to you like this, you don't you haven't understood that understood yet. You know. Yeah. Because well, it should know, be I underneath. My, yeah. I always tell my students to learn a tune by playing just the bass line and just the melody slow, yeah. not complicated, just hearing all the tensions. And then when they get that in the original key, I said, you think you got it? They said, yeah. I said, okay, now do it in G flat. You know, yeah. and they're like, huh? I said, yeah. well, if you really know the tune, you can do it, you know, if you yeah. really hear it. And, you know, then the other thing is, yeah, you find new stuff because unlike guitar, right, you make a half step move on piano and you're in a different country, right? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, number one. And number two, um, and this is something, this was a big surprise to me when I came from saxophone at the age of 25. Because saxophone, whatever acts it is, alto, tenor, doesn't matter. You know, you're playing in one key, it's one thing. You go to another key, the horn has a totally different feel and sound. And when I was playing saxophone, I can't do this anymore. It's very interesting. A record could come on, never mind a live gig, right? And saxophonists could start playing, and in four bars, I'd know what key he's in mm-hmm. or she is in. Because just of this, you know, and alto or tenor, I knew like that, you know. Yeah. And I always assumed piano, not being a piano player at that point, well, that's all the same. You know, I started mm-hmm. playing piano, and boy, was I in for a root shock, you mm-hmm. know, because. As you know, you know, I mean, D flat has one sound, E major has another sound, mm. blah, 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 you know, and the different registers. Um, so, so each, each key is like, it's, it's virgin territory and you got to go there with an open, open mind. Mm. What's the last uh, standard or tune that you, that you moved around like that? In the past days. I'm thinking. You know, I guess the last one was this tune I recorded on the on the the last trio record I did, uh, which is called "And I Love Her." Mm-hmm. And I was going to say it's actually it's not a standard, but it was the Beatles tune, "And I Love yeah. Her," because I pushed it around in a few different keys. You know? Yeah. 
And then, to my surprise, I went back and I listened to the original, and it was in a completely different key. Yeah. You know. Um, but it made sense, because at the end of their chorus, they're in E major, which is a guitar mm. key, right? Yeah. So I thought, oh. But, you know, I ended up hearing it in another place, and that was fine. Mm -hmm. Do you know the Shirley Horn version of that song? No, I don't. I will check it out. Oh man, that's my favorite version. You know, that's is that is that with the orchestra or just true? No, that's an early record. It's my favorite uh, Shirley record. It's called Traveling Light. Was okay, um, and um, uh, I think it's for Impulse. I'm not sure, but it's uh, beginning beginning of the '60s, and she calls it "And I Love Him." And oh. uh, she she plays piano on that. There's a flutist who is sometimes gets in the way a little bit, but her vibe and 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 her playing is just incredible. You know, you, I knew her. you love that. You, yeah, I was going to say you when you played a, a weekly gig in Washington. You sure, uh, you know, oh, must I, have. I lived in Washington. I lived in Washington for ten years yeah. before I moved back. So I knew Shirley, and and all I can tell you about her is, here's a woman. I mean. Any time I played, she was in the club, you know, oh, and she'd yeah. say, I'm coming out to hear the masters tonight. I mean, she's very sweet, you know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'd heard about her and I'd met her a couple of times. And finally, I took this woman I was dating. I said, look, let's go down here. I've never heard her. I should really go hear her live. So we were at this very fancy club called Charlie Bird's Place, which is closed for years. But at that time, Washington had a really big scene. There was Blues Alley, there was the Cellar Door, there was Charlie Birds, there's a lot of music. So there's like, you know, 10 people in the club. And she starts playing. And, you know, I mean, I never heard anybody play that slow, that yeah. good. I mean, I'm like, how is she doing this? Yeah. You know? Did she tell you? Did she talk to you about about those slow tempos, how she does it? No, I mean, I mean, I, for a while, I kind of got it, you know, but mm -hmm. I mean, she was so in there, you know, mm -hmm. and just the sweetest person imaginable. Mm -hmm. And she knew what was going on. I mean, but uh, what a surprise for me, because I thought, All right, so I'm just going to hear this woman who sings and plays piano. And yeah. she gets past the first couple of tunes, and I'm like, how is she doing this? You know? Yes. And 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 with all that space and everything else, it's just the opposite of being bored. You're like hanging on every microsecond. Yeah. You know. What's she gonna do now? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's a remarkable lady. Mm. And um uh, Yeah, she's one of my favorite pianists, uh, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's definitely got some stuff. Mm -hmm. And also, it dropped off on on onto Herbie, also, what she did. Yeah, well, I think so. You know, she just. I mean, the best slow player I ever heard. Yeah. You know. Yeah, absolutely. Yesterday, I was uh, transcribing attempting to transcribe uh, Night Whispers, your song. Oh. I should send you the sheet. If I yeah, still I'm, have it. I'm curious. It's a, it's a, it's a really uh, beautiful song. I really like it. You know, also the record oh, thank is beautiful. You. But um, because I was struggling to, to, to decide on how I should write it down because I'm always my concept, and I transcribe tunes a lot because it, mm. uh, also if I like something, I want to know, you know. So mm. uh, uh, and and with tunes like these, I write it, you know, standards I don't write down, but tunes like these, I write them down because I can bring them to a session, you know. I, I like that, you know. And um, this song, uh, I you know with every song actually, I'm, I'm trying to get as close to not what is the music, but what I think is on the sheet. You know, um, of course, I want to know what the, the notes are that are being played and I will check them out. But I will 
then go another step and see, okay, but what would Mark actually write down and what wouldn't he write down? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and the thing that's is, one, that, that's one way to think of it. The way I kind of think stuff, if you look at it, I believe it's a quote from Herbie on the liner notes to the prisoner, but mm -hmm. if it's not, I read it somewhere else. But uh, somewhere, sometime around that period, Herbie said a couple things. First of all, they asked him what jazz he was listening to. He said, oh, I'm not listening to jazz much anymore. I'm listening to classical music. And you can bet he was listening to like, you know, late 19th, early 20th century stuff. The second thing is, he said, I'm into chords now. I don't even know what to call them. Yeah. And to me, that's the best frame of mind to approach any harmonic unit or chordal unit just what does it sound like you know and the name i used to think when i was in my 20s i used to think the name was important mm -hmm. now i think the name is the least important thing to the point where either i let the other cats name the chords you know mm -hmm. which drew doesn't like so much <laughs> extra work <laughs> for him but or it comes to me, right? Like, oh, this could be called this. But then two days later or two weeks later, I'll go, well, it could also be called this. Of course, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. so, so, because as soon as I think a name, it, it reminds me of, 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 of the, theory books on counterpoint that I looked at in college, you know, I don't want to be put in a box. No, you know? no, totally. I get yeah, what you're so, saying. Yeah. And, and, and in, in, in point of fact, I believe that tune and for sure the bell tolls, which is on the same record. Mm. Uh, I don't think there's many chord symbols, if any. I mean, the bell tolls, I know there are none. I wasn't, actually, and, I wasn't worrying about the chord symbols so much. Yeah. It was where you, where you wrote down the melody was, was my question. Where I wrote it down. You know what I mean? You mean it's, so what I, you know, I have, you know, um, yeah. I have this thing. Right. I put it into the intro which is basically right. the first eight bars, but you also play right. the, the fourth bar, usually play it differently each time. And then I'm, I'm wondering, because you also play the melody with the right hand, but it's doubled by the bass. I was you know, thinking about that for almost an hour. Like, does he put the melody now, does he write it down in the treble clef or in the bass? Oh. Clef, you know, and that kind of freaked me out a little bit because there's, there would also be a way to have it only in two systems, you know, uh, not in, yeah, but two clefs, because you're playing it all at once. Now I see what you mean. Okay. You know, of course, I write chord symbols, but they are more for me to, to quickly access the sound in my mind, but also have something that doesn't box me in right. where I can go right. from, you know? But I'm more right. concerned now with, you're, you're playing, the figure is, it stays more or less the same, but also you're changing mm. it up, of course, because mm. you're improvising and you're reacting. But I'm mm. worried. I'm worried about what was the first thing that you wrote down for this song when you decided, okay, I want to have this figure, but I also want to have this melody. And where would you write it down? This freaked me out mm. a little bit, you know. Mm. I'd have to look at a sheet to remember how. But I think what I did is I had three staffs. I'm yeah. not sure. You know, that's what I think. Um, what I do remember is, uh, I, you know, I've written, not just me, you know, other people have too, but a fair amount of tunes 
over the years where the, the bass and the piano have the melody in unison, kind of yeah. in the tenor register, Yes. which I like. You know, I always like when the trio sounds a little more orchestral, you know. Yeah. And I listen, I remember where I got the idea very clearly. There's a pianist named Bill Mays in America. Uh, I think he's 75, 76 now. And we were, you know, both in New York at the same time. He's actually from San Francisco originally. And, you know, in the in the 80s, the there was this duo room, Bradley's, which was yeah. had music every night. So I went by Bradley's. I don't I don't know if I knew who was there or not. I just went in 11 o'clock at night and and Bill was there with Ron McClure. And the place was like, I mean, it was noisy most of the time. People were getting sloshed. But anyway, and they were playing this tune and it had that device. You know, yeah. he was playing this melody. And I remember the name of the tune. It's called High Street and it's Bill Mace's tune. Mm. And I went home just thinking, man, that was so cool. And yeah. I've used that. To, I've, I told Bill, I said, I really have to thank you, you know, because... Yeah. That's where I got the idea, and I've done. I it wanted a lot to talk to you about that actually, you know, because yeah. I, I noticed that also that this is something that you like to do, and I was yeah. wondering where where you got that idea from, you know. So absolutely from yeah. Bill Mays. Give credit where credit's due. Now I haven't listened to High Street in probably 40 years. I don't know what it sounds like, mm -hmm. but as I recall, it's got that device in it, you know. Mm. Um, But just to walk into Bradley's, you know, where usually it's kind of the standard stuff, you know, and to hear that sound with the, oh, it was, it, it was captivating. Yeah. Yeah, I heard many stories about that place. Oh, yeah, it was it was a real black hole. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but a lot but of music. Coming, coming back to Night Whispers, there's one more question because you're using that device of, of splitting up the chord to, you know. And you stick to it pretty much for the first half of the song. You're playing mm. it more or less the same. Mm. But once it gets to the end of the, the melody, you know, the, I mean, the first ending, the second ending, you play it differently every time. So my question is there again. <laughs> <laughs> when do you decide on a, on a um, device like that to be used? And when do you write it down specifically, you know, in very specific notes? And where do you start writing something and then say maybe similar or, you know, I'm, I'm wondering about your process in that. Listen, remember, switching, I mean, I always played some piano as a kid, but in terms of being a serious pianist, I came to the game a little late. I came without a lot of the stock technical stuff. I mean... I wasn't functionally illiterate. You know, when I had lessons when I was 12, 13, 14, I got to where I could play for release, which is something, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. But but I never went further than that. And so I don't have in the forefront of my mind or fingers a lot of the tools an average pianist might have. I have kind of a different toolbox. So For me, everything's up for grabs, mm -hmm. you know, and for me, anything that's on a sheet of paper. And I, I say this knowing that some people I work with and work for are going to maybe see this. And I have to apologize in advance, <laughs> but they know this already. <laughs> Whatever I see on the printed page, to me, that's a suggestion. And of course, yeah. I'll start with that to respect the composer's wishes. Right. Yeah. But to me, it's just a suggestion. And, yeah. right. you know, if if it's if it's my tune, it's even more so. Uh, I mean, a lot of my tunes. I've seen I years ago, I worked 30, 40 years ago, I used to work a little bit with Tom Harrell. He come in. His scores are like immaculate. Yeah clean everything looks perfect yes. my stuff looks like beethoven's crossed out <laughs> over there, you know yeah to me it's it's all it's just a suggestion mm -hmm. you know and and having processed the suggestion as the tune's going by reading as best i can what's there and my reading is not great but it's good enough um 
and then hearing what's happening, if I'm feeling something different and I think it's appropriate, I'll play the something different. Mm. And this immediately puts me in a certain area where there's only certain kinds of people that are going to want to play with me and vice versa. Mm. And that's fine by me, you know? Mm. Um, and, you know, somebody who wants a piano player who wants to hear exactly what they put on the page, they, they would not be interested in me and I probably mm. wouldn't be interested. In them. And that's, I say that as the same person who was so in awe as we started talking about at the beginning of this, so in awe of Herbie, not only as, as, as a musician and a pianist and as a discoverer of new ways of playing harmony and new ways of playing lines, so in awe of his sense of time and a sense of taste mm -hmm. that he was maybe the most in-demand side man mm -hmm. in the early and mid-60s. I mean, everybody wanted him. You know, and I thought that's who I want to be. And that's mm -hmm. that's what I want to do. You know, plus I'll make a good living and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and and that was that was fine. But there was this other part of me going, uh, uh no, you don't. Yeah, no, no, no. You know, you this is what you're hearing. Do that. Mm. You know? So I had to live with them. You know, it's not that it's not that. I just like cooperating or anything like that. But if I hear something that's better, yeah, I'm probably going to go for it. Now, what normally happens in my situation is the person I'm playing with, the horn player or whoever, unless it's my band, then I do what I want, right? But if it's I, they know what they're getting. But even then, I'll say, I'm kind of hearing it this way. Do you mind if I change that? You know? Yeah. And once in a while, once in a while, they'll say, it's not happening, Mark, leave it alone. And I'll go, okay. But yeah. most of the time they're down with it because they know that's what they're getting when they play with me anyway. You know? Yeah. So, you know, there's pluses and minuses to everything. Mm. Um, you know, I've, I've sat on the other side of that because when I first started playing with Peacock, I mean, you know, <laughs> what he played was what you got, you know, mm -hmm. and you had to deal with it. Uh, and for me, it was a, it was a total blast. Mm -hmm. But I can totally understand how it would mess some people up. And I heard stories, you know, he'd be playing with so and so, and it didn't work out. And I could see why, you know, because mm -hmm. you got to be willing to go with not with what's on the paper, not what with what's on the agenda not mm. what's in your agenda maybe not even with what's in your head you got to go with what's happening with what's yeah. in the air and the minute you bring in a second person it's not all about you anymore it's about the music mm. you know absolutely and that's, yeah and the trickiest thing the trickiest thing and the hardest thing i think for me still even today is when I play solo, you know, it's easy to forget about the air if there's not another person. And I have to remember about the air. And if I remember that, then I'm cool. If I forget about that, then I listen back and I go, ah, I played too much. You know? Yeah. It's hard to leave space when you play alone. It's true. Yeah. Because it's, it, it's you who's coming up with everything. Right. And the, and the thing is, it's 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 so easy to think, oh my God, I got to fill up that space. Nothing else is happening, and that's absolutely what I never want to do when I'm playing. And in spite of myself, it happens sometimes. Mm -hmm. you know? It's understandable, but um, you know, you know, when I'm in in the right zone and I'm really working at moving the voices around on the fly as I'm going. It's no problem because it takes a little bit for that process to happen anyway. You know, mm -hmm. I can't just rip off stuff I've played a hundred times. Yeah. So usually if I've been doing my work, you know, it goes okay. But it's it's a tricky thing and it's a humbling thing because you always have to go back to, you know, 
you have to go back to some of the simplest things sometimes just to remind yourself, which is normal, I think. Mm. You know? um, it's always I wanna, a process. I want to uh, talk about friends. And linked to that, I want to talk about your the way because when I listen to that album, you know, uh, just today, I felt like I, I love I love the album and I love how you play on it. And um, how should I say this? Of course, I knew you as a piano player first. And now having listened to that album, I was kind of curious to see when you play lines on the piano, the lines sound different. And of course, that's a long time ago, friends. But I was looking for, uh, I was listening to those lines you play on the on the saxophone, and it really sounds very different uh, the way you approach stuff. And uh, I'm interested in the process of when you decided that you're not going to play saxophone anymore, but you're interested in the piano, and you even work in in different areas than but but. Uh, concentrating on learning the piano for several years. Um, I was wondering what your process was also of letting go of stuff, you know, of, of things that you know and really concentrating on this new instrument. The way it happened was a little different than what you described. The way it happened was I was practicing the horns less and less. And I was spending more and more time at this Fender Rhodes in my loft writing tunes, which were unlike anything else that I knew. The, the things that were closest to them, and they weren't close at all, but at least they were on the same planet, were tunes that Ralph Tanner was writing. And Ralph Towner and John Abercrombie and I were hanging out, writing together, playing together. And they're very different from Ralph's tunes and John's tunes, but they were more like them than anything else that was going on. And they also were clearly the most sophisticated thing harmonically uh, that I was coming up with. And they also felt the most natural. Mm -hmm. And they felt the most personal. So I was just spending more and more time playing these tunes at the Fender Rhodes. And I knew how I wanted them to sound, you know. Oh, playing them and playing them. And it's mostly working with the, the chords and the voicings and the spacings and some with the lines. But I wasn't playing a lot of the lines at that point. And then I thought, well, this is ridiculous. You know, I... Let me see if I can do something with these on saxophone because these tunes are really important. But I'm, uh, hopefully, I can get somebody to make these sound right on the on the piano, which was a Rhodes. So over the period of five weeks, here's who came over. I invited them all, and I knew what this was. This was like the last gasp of the saxophone career. Mm -hmm. It's Richie Byrack, hmm. Don Grolnick, Hal Galper, a uh, guy from Boston, Ted Saunders, Teddy Saunders hmm. from Boston. Uh, maybe Ralph, because Ralph played some piano. I'm not oh, yeah. sure about that. Not sure about that. But I definitely remember Teddy, Don, Richie, Hal. And there must have been one other. And I said, I'd really you mind playing these tunes with me. I'm really trying to do something. No, no problem. So we spent a couple hours. I played alto. They played the roads. They all brought something different to the tunes. They all played them great. And none of them got it. When I say none of them got it, it would be like Joni Mitchell inviting five really accomplished guitarists to play her tunes. Now she's not a killing guitar player, but she knows how her tunes are supposed to feel. She knows how to tune the open tunings to get what she wants, blah, blah, blah. 
And of course, at that time, that's all I listened to for six months was Joni Mitchell. Huh. You know, so that's that's where my head was at. So it wasn't that I wanted to play piano. It wasn't that I didn't want to play saxophone, although I was bored to tears with it. It was that I'd been gripped by this thing that was going on with me in these tunes, and something had to happen with them. So that's what happened. I just kept playing them on the Fender Roads, and I kept doing it and kept doing it. And next thing I knew, I moved out to California, um, gave away most of my LPs, drove out there. I had a girlfriend out there, and uh, I started doing whatever little gigs came up. I was playing with Elliot Sigmund and Ron McClure, who were both working out there. I don't believe we ever did a gig, but we got together and played. And uh, then Elliot moved back, and then Ron moved back, and then I figured, all right, I might as well move back. Um, uh, but that's how the whole thing started. You know, mm -hmm. I just, I, I, I had to do something with those tunes. And what that was, was it was the, all the stuff I'd been hearing and taking note of from the beginning of our conversation, you know, the Ernst Toch book and the, the way chords move differently and all that. It wasn't saxophone stuff. It wasn't applicable. And, and listen, I can't sit here and say it's impossible to play harmonically cool on the saxophone. Of course <laughs> it's possible. You know, mm. I just didn't hear it that way. I didn't feel it that way. Um, and and to be honest, when I was in San Francisco, I had this little once a week gig at a coffee house playing Fender Rhodes, playing my little tunes. And I taught, put an ad in the paper. I was teaching privately. And I, you know, jazz. Eh, whatever, it'll happen when it's going to happen. And then I remember I was visiting a friend in uh, Seattle. I was working up there with a ballet company. And Bill Evans came on the radio, and all of a sudden this light bulb went off. I said, that's a way in. You know, because the sensibility that I got from listening to Joni Mitchell – which I felt in the tunes I was writing and playing, I didn't hear it anywhere in jazz. Not really. Not even with Ralph's tunes and John's tunes. And then when this early Bill Evans came on the radio, I went, maybe that. Mm -hmm. So I started checking that out. And you hadn't heard B Bill Evans before? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But I'd always been very dismissive of him. Remember, ah. I was into like Coltrane and Sonny Rollins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, what's that? McCoy, Herbie, yeah. okay. Bill, man. Ah, I see. And, I see. And I heard the early stuff, and all of a sudden I was like, wow, what a dope. I missed the whole point. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, there's no burning lines and strong rhythm and anything. That's not what this is about, you mm. know. Um, And I mean, there are great lines, but you know yeah, what I mean. Yeah. So that's when I got into playing the standard ballads real slow because that was that's my way in, mm. you know. And as far as learning to play bebop and stuff like that, uh, when I did come back to New York, I was upstate in the countryside for about six months, and then I ended up moving to Washington, D.C., because a couple good musicians down there, a bass player and a piano player, had a steady gig, a bass player and a drummer. They had a steady gig, and they needed a piano player. Um, and they played good. You know, they played kind of modern and good. So I ended up moving down there. Um, and the way I got the bebop together, because they were playing sort of like open – weather report kind of stuff for lack of a better first album you know the one yep. that's the jazziest yeah uh, you know like that medium groove straight ahead thing Salmonal plays like that you know mm. um the way i got into learning all the lines and everything was not practicing there was this amateur or semi-professional but good trumpet player and he had sessions at his house once a week 
So I started going over there, you know, and it was very nice. His wife would serve soup and we'd just play along, came Betty and all the stuff, you know. The players were good. One time Butch Warren showed up. Wow. Butch from the yeah. old, you know, Blue Note Records with Herbie. Yeah. Because uh, he was down in Washington living with his mother or something. He had some kind of emotional problems, but he mm -hmm. was he was getting himself together. He sounded great, you know, mm. uh, kind of older style, but really good. You know. Yeah, she was an incredible player. Um, yeah, so after a year or two of that, I kind of, you know, it was one thing to come from saxophone and play my pretty little tunes in A minor and F major and blah, blah, <laughs> blah. You know, but then the, along came Betty, I really had to learn all the little stuff, you know. Yeah. Uh, and that was fine, because I learned it just by hearing it and doing it. I, it you know, I knew what I wanted to play. It was just a question of getting it under my fingers. You know? I see. So that was relatively painless. And I think better than practicing it, you know. Where are these tunes now that you wrote on your roads? Yeah? Did you yeah. record them ever? Uh, One of them is on an album I did with a British saxophonist named Stan Saltzman about 20, 25 years ago. Okay, I want to listen uh, to that song. What's it, what's it called? It's called Guinevere. G-U-I-N-E-V-E-R-E. -E. Yeah, okay. Uh, if you can't find it, I'll send it to you. I have no idea if that's on YouTube or not. Might yeah, I'll check it out. Yeah. Um, But... Some some other anyway, tunes from that from that period. Yeah, but you know, most of them most of them I didn't record really because I mean, by the time I got my my first couple of dates as a real leader on piano, you know, I, I was writing what I thought were much better tunes. I mean, they were in the same line of development, but mm -hmm. I mean. Night Whispers and the Bell Tolls are, they're, they're better, they're further along and more developed, but it's, it's, to me, it's the same line of development. I see, yeah. You know, just the kind of sound and everything. Yeah. I'm curious, you know, when you talk about your career and your development and also these decisions and, and uh, milestones in your, in your, in your life, it seems that you have a great sense of patience, you know, um, because your um, visibility in terms of being in the, in the, being recognized for what you, what you are, who you are, came relatively late in your life, you know, as opposed to yeah. others. Yeah. And you seem, you seem okay about this. And you see, when you talk about this now, Uh, I'm wondering where, because there are there are young people out there uh, who who want to be the new guy that everybody wants to play with tomorrow or maybe yesterday, you know. Um, so I think we can all learn a great deal from from that. So I'm wondering what what your thoughts are on this. If if anything. there's two factors at work here. One is the kind of stuff you're talking about, especially these days, uh, or even in the last 20 years, as opposed to when I was first coming up in the 70s, is very, very dependent on luck, on the media, on uh, you know whatever producer or whoever decides to take a, an interest to you you know I mean if somebody gets three four record dates as a leader on ECM you know they're kind of all set so I don't have any control over that yeah you know what I have control over is what I'm playing And in the end, 
I had a gig when I first came back to New York. I was working a lot with a bass player called Stafford James, who used to play with Woody Shaw. Yeah. He liked what I was doing, and he was getting us duo gigs. Very nice guy. Um, haven't seen him in a long time. So we're playing uh, in this big restaurant in Soho. Another one of these places, big, fancy, like an airplane hangar, high ceiling. We're on this little stage, and all these really wealthy people are sitting, eating these fabulous dinners, you know. And the music is kind of a second thought. And because it's so big, and because there's no rugs or anything, I mean, and the people are all talking, you know, it's it's hard to get over. And you're there, basically, the owner likes jazz, and he's paying you just so he can say he has live jazz, and nobody's paying attention, right? But everybody played there, you know, with a, it was called Green Street, the mm. place. Um, so we're getting near the end of a set. We tried, you know, he's calling the tunes because it was his gig and blah, 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 you know, funny Valentine, autumn leaves, whatever. We're playing some nice stuff. You know, one or two people clapping between tunes. I mean, nothing. So he looks over at me with a very pained look. He says, what do you want to play for the last tune? I said, Let's play capotasto. Now, capotasto is some kind of technique on the bass. Bass player would know. I have no idea what it means. But it's Italian, obviously. It's also the name of a tune Stafford wrote, which is all kind of A-Phrygian, and it's kind of really closer to the kind of thing he was doing when he played with Woody Shaw. It's like boom, 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 ba -doo -doo -doo, boom, 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 you know, all dark strong rhythm you know he looks at me like you sure i said yeah so we play it about two minutes in the place quiets down we get done the thing and the whole place applauds like a regular gig and we're coming off the stand he says mark they really like capatasto <laughs> they ignored everything we played all the set and then they liked that, and which, you know, he was afraid to play because it was so in your face. And these people were all in dinner. He said, he said, how did you know? How did you know? I said, man, he said, I didn't know. Here's what I knew. I felt like playing it. Just right there. You said, what do you want to play? And I felt capatasto. So. I thought, okay, we can do one of two things. And this all happened in the space of five, 10 seconds. Stafford says, you said to me, are you sure you want to do this? So the wheels are turning and I'm thinking, okay, I can play it safe and we can play another tune and hope they like it and they probably won't listen, maybe they will. And the whole set's been a complete drag. Or we can play Capatasto Maybe a few people will listen. Maybe they'll really hate it and get bugged and not like it and not applaud. But it ain't going to be much worse than what's already happened. And you know, <laughs> when we get done, we'll at least have the satisfaction of knowing we played. We played yeah. something we really yeah. wanted to do. Whereas if we don't play something we really wanted to play, and then they don't like that, which by the way had been happening the whole set, then we got nothing. Hmm. So I said, that's an easy decision. Let's play what we want to play. He looked at me and said, you're right. I said, well, it was lucky, you know. So the point was not that we got them. The point was we played what we wanted to play. Mm -hmm. And it happened that it tuned them right in. That was luck of the draw, you know. Uh, could have backfired. But so in terms of Everything you're talking about, I mean, all I can control is playing honest music and playing what feels right, trying to play new stuff. I'm working on new stuff, hopefully, all the time. Hopefully, each record I do, there's something a little different on there, harmonically, melodically, whatever. Um, and as far as what you're talking about,
you know, if I could control it, that'd be one thing. I can't, you know. So it's it's like the Sanford James gig. You know, I'm just going to play what I want to play, try and make the best stuff I can. Mm. Hopefully, will somebody like it? And I, you know, I, as you can imagine, I get this kind of question fairly frequently, you know, um, even now. Mm. And, you know, I think at the end of the day, my whole life has been about because I made a decision early on. I take it back. I didn't make a decision. The decision kind of dragged me along with it. You know, mm -hmm. I said, this is what you need to be doing. Mm. Look how this feels. Look how this sounds. And I was like, OK, I can't stand in the way of this anymore. Mm. That's how the, the, the interest in harmony happened. That's how the switch to piano happened. That's how the move to Washington, D.C. happened. That's how the move back to New York City happened. Blah, blah, blah. And. Um, and, and, and this is where. I'm going to sound a little bit like Peacock, but it's true. If you just get out of the way and allow what has to happen, happen and do the work, it'll work out. And, you know, every everything else is, is kind of out of my control. And I try and focus on, on, on what's most important. And I think that's, that's, that's the best way. You know, it's... Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's at the, at the end of the day, you know. Now now here we are in the midst of this whole Corona thing as we're doing this. You know, there's an awful lot of heavy stuff going on, you know, and all the rest of it, all the rest of us. You know, we're trying to make some good music. We're going to try and come out of this thing whenever it ends and winds down, which eventually will wear. And we're going to try and keep going on making good music as best we can. And there's all sorts of important things going on in the world. And, and the most important thing I think an artist can do is to try and make honest art. To me. And then whatever else happens, that's, that's not in my control. Mm. That's beautiful, Mark. Well, it is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> and I think Or, that's a good, it's a good place to stop, right? It feels like it. Okay. And right. thank you so much for doing this. Uh, really oh, meant a lot listen, to me. Thanks for having me.